watched over us this week, and we've come to your house now to worship you. And we look to you to bless our hearts and strengthen and help us through this day and this coming week. This is Thanksgiving Sunday, and we're so thankful, Lord Jesus, for the many blessings that you provide to us and how you do supply our needs. And thank you for how you've watched over your church and kept your hand upon it. The scripture that we read this morning, Lord, talked about your righteous hand, and we're so thankful, Lord, that, that, that we can depend on you and trust you in these days, that, that you'll, you'll hear and answer prayer, and you know what we need before we even come to you. There's a lot of needs here this morning, Lord, that we've mentioned. Uh, Brother Lee's in the hospital. Pray that you keep your hand upon him, and on Dolores, and on Lynn, and, and uh, the others that we've mentioned, Lord, there's Dorothea there at UT. Pray you keep your hand upon her. We, we ask, Lord, that you'd heal their bodies and encourage and strengthen their hearts as it would be your will. Bless Brother Clarence today, Lord. We know that uh, uh, this is a hard time for him with Dorothea being down and, and just ask that you encourage his heart and strengthen him. We pray for Stacy and Laura this morning, Lord. As they're, they're having their service this morning, we pray that you would uh, visit them in a special way and undertake for them and help him to have that special unction as he preaches this morning. And then here, Lord, as we sing and lift our hearts to you and, and we, we listen to the words of the songs and, and it stirs our heart and our soul this morning, Lord, we just pray for a time of refreshing that would come from the hand of God this morning. Bless Brother Robert as he comes to lead us. And we thank you again for bringing Jerry back and we pray that you just continue to strengthen his body and help us to heal. This morning, Lord Jesus, if we know our hearts, we love you with all of our heart and we just pray that you would bless us and strengthen and help us as we stand before this congregation this morning, Lord, with the open book of God. We pray that you'd be honored and glorified. May you receive all the praise this day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, and while you're standing, we're going to go ahead. Brother Robert's going to sing that with us in a minute, but we're going to sing it now. I'm so glad. so good and so smart, how come we're all so dumb? I said, because we didn't have them. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll do this. I'd love to hug your neck, but we we're really proud of you. And I could have gotten roses or mums or all kinds of stuff, but I thought, you know, it's Christmas, and yeah. she can enjoy this a whole Absolutely. lot longer, and she can enjoy a little bouquet of cut flowers. Yeah. So we want you to have this, and we want to give you an applause one more time. Any of our kids have her as a teacher now? Uh, third grade. She teaches third grade. She's third grade. No, I guess not. Well, that's okay. But we are sure proud of her. And it's a, a real privilege for me to be able to do that. Brother Robert, come. Get your hymnal or watch the screen. And we're going to sing. And Matthew's going to get rid of all these wonderful announcements. And uh, <laughs> worship the Lord together. Okay? Good morning, Brother Robert. Good morning. How many of you are glad to be a part of the family of God? Amen. Turn back to uh, 681 if you want to use your hymnal. We'll sing that one more time. As we, uh, y'all forgive me, I've got to put my 
persistence on here. I'm so glad.
I had the privilege to go to Jubilee and Gatlinburg here in the September, I think it was. Yeah. And uh, I bought a DVD from them. And uh, they were planning to do a, which they did do, a album of hymns. Yeah. And this one was on there. And it's one you don't hear very often. And anyway, they made a, they did a rehearsal and put it out on the Facebook. Yeah. This was on a Tuesday morning, and by Friday afternoon, they had had 250,000 hits. <laughs> so it just proves that people still love the old hymns of the church. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
this song. Yeah. Exactly where it is. 
Uh, and that makes it a little bit easier. That's a, that's a thick Bible. And uh, this is Communion Sunday for Thanksgiving. We'll do this again around Christmas, but um, um, 1519 is the number. John chapter 6, verse 52. Um, Communion Sunday. I think uh, we have an awful lot to be thankful for. I just heard uh, this morning that the uh, largest church in Monroe County has been closed down again for the virus. So pray for them. Uh, pray for all of our churches. I say our churches because we are the family of God. Uh, it's not us and them. God help us from an us and them kind of religion. Uh, as long as they're preaching the, the truth and teaching the truth, I can pray for them and support them. Uh, I want them to, because they're going to reach people that I'll never touch, and we're going to reach people they'll never touch. And and the point is, we're all we're all trying to get to the same place, and that's to be with the Lord forever in heaven. So we have a lot of, a lot to be thankful for. Uh, we've only had one incident of the virus here, and God's been good to us uh, and watched over us, and we're so thankful for that. <coughs> I appreciate the fact that you do do some distancing and you do try to be careful. I mean that sincerely. Uh, don't panic because we ran out of masks this morning. Uh, we've got some homemade ones back there if you really need one when you leave. Carl's got a couple, okay? How many? We got more. More, okay. Um, I didn't know we had more, that's great. But uh, we, we want to keep furnishing those to you and plenty of hand sanitizer. We got plenty of soap and water in the bathrooms. And, and so we just want you to know we appreciate you. So now that you've all found the scripture, I want to give you just a little background. Jesus has, in this chapter, fed the 5,000 already. What a miracle. That's a great miracle. Do we still have miracles? Absolutely, we still have miracles. I woke up this morning. I woke up this morning. That was a miracle because I didn't have any right to expect that. Except as long as the Lord has use for us, Wesley said, John Wesley said, we're immortal. So I'm thankful that I had a purpose to be here this morning. Uh, Jesus has walked on the water. He, uh, another wonderful miracle. Maybe only the disciples saw that, but they needed it and they saw it. And he has been talking about the fact that he is the bread of life. And then we come to verse 52. After all of that, then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of my of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him, just as the living Father has sent me. And I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. He goes on again to make another miracle when he uh, goes, goes forward from this point. Um, he goes to the Feast of Tabernacles and, and he teaches there again. But because of these things that he said in the, this sixth chapter of John, a lot of followers left Jesus. It was just too much for them to absorb. Yeah. It's not an excuse, but they stopped following him. The celebration of communion is always one of the most worshipful experiences for me in the church. We remember the suffering, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. It's a tender moment for all Christians. It ought to be a really, really special moment for every one of us, regardless of, of who we are or what we are in the faith when we realize that this is the shed blood and broken body of Jesus that we're representing, it ought to be a really special time. Jesus has specifically addressed the need in chapter 6 here for sustenance, for the soul to be fed. 
as I said, the 5,000 have been fed. Other miracles have been done. And now they had the nerve to ask him in the previous verses for a sign. Unbelievable. Is, is the feeding of the 5,000 not enough? Is walking on water not enough? And you just go back through the scriptures and all the miracles that Jesus, is it not enough? They want one more sign. Remember that Jesus said, an evil and perverse generation asked for a sign. I don't need a sign or a miracle this morning. I know what he did in my heart. And that's enough. So I don't need to see a miracle. I don't need to see anybody walk on water. I don't need to see 5,000 fed. Although we have been in situations where we, we were feeding people and we thought we were going to run out of food. And, and miraculously, the last person got food. Right. It's amazing. Yes. It's like, uh, you remember Kim and Jeff being here. And, and I, I kind of stole their thunder. But uh, the, when the Pikes were here, they had been to uh, West Virginia to do a mission trip. And they needed a pair of shoes for one child. And the shoes were all gone that would fit that child. And miraculously, another box of shoes appeared. And that child also was taken care of as they ministered to those children. Amen. That's a wonderful thing. That's a great thing that they got that. But I don't need that sign to believe because I know what happened in my heart when I became a Christian. Amen. They understood the comparison that Jesus gave here to him being the bread of life in that fifth, in sixth chapter, beginning in verse 25. They understood it completely. There was no doubt in their mind what Jesus was saying. He is claiming to be the Messiah, the Son of God, the very bread of life. What a, it, it was an astounding thing for him to do this, yet they fully grasped what he was saying and they still ask for the sign Jesus says some simple but profound things to them they were nonetheless troubled by what he said and he then begins explaining to them that all men point number one all men are drawn to the father yes Amen. there's no such thing as predestination and some are predestined to be saved and some are predestined to be lost the scripture is very clear. It's not God's will that anyone perish, but that all would come to repentance. Amen. So God the Father draws. We do not one day wake up and decide, well, today I'm going to become a Christian. Yep. Now, if you're led that way, it's because the Holy Spirit's yes. been drawing you. But you don't just get up and make an intellectual decision one day and say, today I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to become a Christian. And I've known a couple of people that did that. And it did take some time for them to find the Lord. But at least they took one step in the right direction. So if you're listening to me today here or by live streaming, and you uh, have a hunger and a hole in your heart that's not been filled, you take a step towards God and then let the Holy Spirit begin to lead you and help you to get there to that point. We just don't make an intellectual decision. One of the problems we have in the church I'm talking about the, the global church, all denominations, is we have too many professors in our schools yeah. who have made an intellectual choice yeah. to teach Christianity or become a professor in Christianity or religion or Hebrew, whatever you want to call it. It's nothing but an intellectual decision. There's nothing in the heart. Yeah. Because when I hear a professor tell me that they do not believe in the miracles of Jesus as recorded in the New Testament, that person's not been saved. Right. Uh, there, there's just no, nothing else you can tell me. Um, there has to be something in the heart to go with what's going on in the head. Right. I know a lot about theology. I do. But you know, I, I, was, I was getting ready this morning, I was thinking about this statement that I'm about to make to you. I learned a lot of theology around the church. I learned more at school. I learned more in the course of study. Uh, I've learned over the years reading various people. I'm reading a wonderful book right now. It's an old book in, in the early 1900s by, by a man named Joseph Smith. And it's not that Joseph Smith that started a cult. He is, was a holiness evangelist. And it's wonderful theology on Pauline perfection 
Paul's teaching of perfection throughout the scriptures. It's wonderful. I can, I can hardly wait to go to bed at night to get to read another chapter. It's all theology. And that's all wonderful. But you've got to have something in the heart to make the light bulbs go on when you read those scriptures that Paul's, and, and we don't always, even always think about the scriptures that Paul is, that, that Smith is writing about, that Paul spoke, that are dealing with Christian perfection. You say, is there such a thing? Of course there is. God in His grace can make us as perfect as we can be in this world. Amen. And we call that Christian perfection. Amen. Does it mean we're never going to sin again? Well, absolutely not. You're going to mess up. You're still human. You're going to be. You're going to get out of bed like I did a day or two, uh, not long ago, and be a little bit on the grumpy side. But you get your coffee and some food in your tummy. Amen. Amen. And on a day like uh, Martha's going to be quiet. I can already tell you that. But it's one of those days where anything she says to you sounds like a command. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could enjoy the sunshine? I don't want to enjoy the sunshine. <laughs> Y'all ever have a morning like that? Well, we're still human. But we don't just decide to become a Christian. The Holy Spirit draws and woos us into coming to Him. Aren't we thankful that He's tender with us? Amen. What would it be if the Holy Spirit grabbed you by the neck of the neck and said, Get down here, boy. You're going to get right today. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Come. Come on. Come to me. Come. Just listen. He's telling you the truth. We have to make our move, though, while the Spirit of God is speaking to us about the condition of our heart. Amen. Amen. Almost Persuaded is a wonderful song. Yes. Uh, it was written because of Paul standing in front of of, of the king and the king said almost you persuade me to be a Christian we have to move when the spirit moves Amen. now that's not to say that, that the Holy Spirit's going to come and say you got to do this you got to do it right now right now remember what I told you a few weeks ago if I have to do it right now it's not of the Lord he'll always give me time to pray he'll always give me time to move he'll always give me time to think it through and he will you too. But he is faithful to speak to us about the condition of our heart. We don't want to wait and miss the opportunity. I've missed some, I've told you this before, I've missed some opportunities in my day. Sometimes when I felt the impression, you ought to go see about so-and-so. You ought to call so-and-so. You ought to check on them. And the next thing I know, they're gone from this world. We need to be faithful when he speaks to do our best to obey. And he'll take care of the rest. So all men are drawn to the Father. And in our coming to him, point two is, we need to exercise faith. It's not always easy to do. But we need faith. You had faith this morning when you came to this building that the lights would be on, the heat would be on, the, 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 the music would be ready, the pastor would be ready. And there'd be masks and hand sanitizers and, and faith, actually, that you won't come in here and catch the virus. Now, you may not have thought about all that as you got ready and put your clothes on and drove to church. But that's exactly what happened this morning. You exercised a measure of faith. And when we come to the Lord, we have to exercise some faith. I know people that cannot make the step of faith. I've seen people right on the edge and they just cannot take that step of faith to trust Him. And we have to do that as we come to the Lord. The whole of the gospel is not difficult to understand at all. We talk about theology and we study theology and you ought to be thankful that, that you've got some preachers around this church that, that have studied theology. That's a wonderful thing. But the whole of the gospel W-H-O-L-E, the whole thing. It's not hard to understand. God created us. Man sinned. Jesus came and died for us. He was crucified. He rose again. He ascended to heaven. And He draws us to Himself. And it's that simple. Amen. And then we start living for Him. And He fills in the blanks. Amen. Aren't you glad? Yeah. Man, 
That's shouting ground. Yeah. It's easy to understand. In fact, the Bible says it's so simple that a fool and a wayfaring man, that means somebody with no education at all, can understand the plan of salvation. Amen. It's just that easy. I heard a story one time about a, 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 a pastor who was witnessing to his doctor and and uh, the, the time seemed to be right and, and he took a piece of paper in the exam room and, and, and talked about sin and talked about God and this great chasm that, that came between God and man because of sin. And the cross of Christ is the bridge that brings man back to God. A beautiful presentation. I shortened it greatly. And the doctor looked at him and said, I just can't believe anything like that. Uh -huh. I just can't believe it. Amazing. It's that simple, folks. There's a, a gulf between us and God because of sin, and the cross of Christ is the bridge to cross. Amen. His sacrifice to us. We place our trust in Him. Verse 47 uh, of this chapter uh, says, I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life, verse 48 says. He who believes. In fact, the scripture says, Jesus himself said, if you believe on my name, you will be saved. Because, you know, if you're not a Christian, you can't really believe on his name. Right. You may believe his history tells us that he lived. But when we believe on his name for, for our very salvation, then we have life. He who believes has an everlasting life, the Bible says. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life in verse 48. <laughs> Listen very carefully. If you don't take anything else home, take this little nugget home today. Jesus already said this in the, in, in the scripture that I read this morning. He talks about manna in the desert. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. The Jews are 40 years roaming around in the desert and and six days a week manna fell. Uh, we're not sure what it tastes like, but it was kind of nutty flavored, they believe. And they could just use it for all kinds of things in food preparation. They didn't just eat manna. They could use it to cook with. And, and they had manna in the desert and they ate it, yet they died even though they ate the very bread from heaven. Because they were disobedient. They did not believe. We can come along the journey, folks. And somewhere along the way, something can distract us. And cause us to lose out with God. And we have to confess that to Him. If we have a lack of faith, we have to confess that. Now, God was good to him. In the desert, their clothes didn't wear out, their shoes didn't wear out. I, I, I guess they still had babies for 40 years in the, in, in the wilderness. So somebody inherited somebody else's shoes when they died. Did you ever think of that? Somebody inherited somebody else's clothes. The Bible tells us they roamed for 40 years following the cloud and the pillar of fire. But they never were very far away from the promised land but they were out of the promised land. The tragedy in life is to be that close, yet miss it. What a great tragedy. To be so close to where they needed to go. They weren't 500 miles away. And, and some scholars say they, they never were more than 20 miles or so in a circle. I guess when you get in the desert, it all begins to look the same over the years. But there is a bread from heaven, the Bible tells us, that a man may eat and not die. And Amen. Jesus himself claimed to be that bread right here in this sixth chapter of John. Amen. We, we, can, we can take living bread. Communion bread is not a living thing. It's just a piece of unleavened bread. Uh, it's simple. It's plain. It's usually kind of dry. It's easy to make at home. You just stir up flour and water and pour it out on the thing and bake it in the oven. It won't rise if you use plain flour. It's not very tasty. It's not something you'd ever go in the kitchen and say, oh, honey, could I have a, could I have a big slice of that unleavened bread with my eggs this morning for toast? <laughs> no, no, you wouldn't do that. 
but it gives life none the same. It will still give life. It would still sustain you. And just like our Lord, who is plain, down to earth, not very appetizing to the world and the sinful world on first glance because they do not realize their hunger. The world does not realize their hunger. They do not realize their need and they do not realize the simplicity of accepting Jesus Christ as Savior. It's sad. John 52 uh, John 6.52 of this chapter says that a sharp argument arose. Let me read that verse again. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us flesh to eat? They all questioned what he said to them. Yeah. They just could not grasp it. They could not believe. My last point this morning is this. Unless you eat this bread and drink this blood, you have no life in you. Not this bread and blood. Not this bread and this juice. This is a representation. But unless we drink the blood of Christ, unless we eat the bread of his broken body that was bruised on the cross for us, we will not have eternal life. We do not believe as some that the juice in these glasses or the wine uh, and the bread on this plate are transformed into the literal body and blood of Christ. That is called the doctrine of transubstantiation. We don't believe that. Uh, the Catholic Church teaches that. Neither do we say that the bread is just plain old bread. Nor this drink is plain old grape juice. That's why your pastor has never allowed children to drink the juice or eat the bread that's left over from communion. We always wanted to have that special effect on our hearts. And if we just eat it and drink it for fun, we lose something. It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like going swimming in the same water that you just got baptized in for another two hours. Yeah. You know? We want that moment to be special. And I know at the Father's Day picnic, we still played in the water. But I want you to know that baptism is one of the most special things I ever remember in my ministry. We do believe that the bread represents the body of our Lord. It was a body broken on the cross for our sins. Yeah. His body was began to be broken when they first arrested him. We think of the cross. But the breaking of his body started way before the cross. When he was whipped and mocked and crowned with thorns, beaten unmercifully, and then forced to carry his cross up the hill to the crucifixion, his sacrifice of his body was a wonderful act of love and compassion for a lost world. It was broken all the way along the Via Della Rosa. His body being so broken could not help but cause blood to be shed in the events surrounding his death. I'm reading this to you so I won't mess it up after I wrote it. He did not just spill blood on the top of Golgotha, the place where they crucified him. He spilled blood. From the first slap of his face, the first time they hit him and wounded him in Pilate's jail, drop after drop, falling, falling around the feet of the soldiers, splattering and falling on their clothes, yeah. now even on their skin. And out into the streets, up through the palace halls, up the steps, and down the paths. As he stood on the balcony over the people, as a crown was placed on his head and a robe on his back, again blood splattered and spilled. It was not just on Golgotha, but
but all through the royal palace, the jail, the streets of Jerusalem, yeah. and then finally on the Via Della Rosa up to Calvary, our Savior shed every drop of atoning blood. Sacrificial blood meant to redeem a lost world. And not one person took notice of the life-giving flow. An old song came to me this morning as I was getting ready for church. Sometimes I sing in the shower. Most of the time I just listen to the radio. Jerry will remember this old song. I, I, don't, I don't think it's in our hymnal now, but we've got a copy of it. And the words to that song said, Under the atoning blood of the Lamb. Under the atoning blood of the Lamb. Safely I am hiding, constantly abiding, under the atoning blood. Every drop of blood that this grape juice represents made the apology to God for our sin and redeemed us time and eternity if we'll trust Him. What a wonderful thing. We sang the song this morning. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So today we'll celebrate the communion feast. It is a special time. This is Thanksgiving Sunday. In a few days, we're going to gather in our homes with our family and maybe some friends, and we're going to celebrate and eat and, and gorge ourselves on turkey and dressing and all the trimmings of pumpkin pie and Lord knows what other kind of dessert. I hope that we'll remember yeah. to truly be thankful. Amen. Amen. I hope that as we bless the food, we'll remember that he blessed the, the, the Passover meal, which was the bread and the juice, and that we'll be thankful. I hope that we'll remember that we have hope because we can eat of his body and drink of his blood and have eternal life. Amen. I hope we will celebrate his goodness. Communion is a time the scripture says for us to do some self-examination and maybe confession and receive forgiveness if we need it. We're going to stop now in just a moment and reflect for a few minutes. Matthew, you can go ahead and start that music. A little lower, of course. Just drop it a little more, brother. I want us to take a moment and reflect on our lives, yeah. our spiritual state. Is there anything between us and God that needs to be fixed up? If so, these altars are open always. Anything between us and anybody else this morning that's here that we could need to fix up? If you'd like to slip forward and pray about anything, altars are open. Yeah. But you can also simply pray in your seat. I'll soon be 70 years old. I've done a lot of business with God sitting on the pew. A lot. And you know what? He's always been faithful. I told somebody this week, I said, you know, you don't, you don't need to tell everybody everything. Some things ought not to be confessed publicly. Some things ought not to be told to everyone. But to Him. Let Him deal with it. And let Him deal with you. Father, this morning we thank you for these moments together when we're going to celebrate this Lord's Supper. We thank you, Lord, that you gave us the promise that you would not eat or drink of this again until we do it together in the New Jerusalem. So we practice here, Lord. From time to time we come together and, and we practice what we'll do with you when we get to heaven, which is eat this meal again together with you who gave yourself for us. You've
broke your body and shed your blood that we might be together with you in heaven. So we trust you this morning that the Holy Spirit will be faithful to help us to open our hearts and let the searchlight of your love walk through the crevices and the crannies of our soul. We're so thankful, Lord, that when we fail, you are so kind to gently remind us that we can be better. We forgive and you restore. So this morning, Lord Jesus, as we pass these elements in a few minutes, we pray you'd bless them. Not only as nourishment and strength through our physical body, but nourishment and strength through our souls, because we celebrate your death and your resurrection and the price that you paid for us that we might be free from sin. We commit it to you, and we glorify and honor you in it this morning, in Jesus' name. Now, I need a little help here, and uh, I have two wonderful people right here on this front bench. They're going to help me serve this communion this morning. They just don't know it yet. Tom and Denise, will you come and help me, please? This is a touchless communion. I'm going to go ahead and take one just so I can remind them. Your wafer is in the top of the cup. You peel the first little layer off to get the, the wafer, if you can do it that way. And, and then uh, we'll peel it again to get the, the juice. Let me remind you that in the Church of the Nazarene, we do not celebrate close communion. In, in our denomination, if you name the name of Christ and you believe your sins are forgiven, you're welcome to celebrate this with us. This is the family of God. We don't restrict it to members of our church. So all of you are welcome to participate this morning. And we thank you for being here. that broken body. Let us take it and eat it together and be thankful.
Again, Lord, we thank you this morning. I thank you for your presence that we sense here. I thank you for each person that's gathered. How thankful we are that we can celebrate this Lord's Supper and, and we can remember. We remember how lost we were. Even as a 10-year-old boy, Lord Jesus, we knew that we were not ready to go to heaven said so many times we were born and raised in Nazarene, but we became a Christian at 10. How thankful we are. How glad we are that we were raised in a church that believed that sin was bad and God was good and Jesus would redeem and fill and save and sanctify us and pardon us and establish a, a relationship with us that would allow us to serve you and love you all the way to heaven. And how glad we are this morning, Lord, as we look back over our life, the people that we've known and people that we've met that have come the same way that we did, Lord, in faith, saying, I'm sorry for my sin and asking you to forgive us and get us ready for heaven. How thankful we are that day by day there's grace and mercy that's more abundant than we could have ever imagined as we walk and serve you and trust you. So bless us now this morning. As we've taken of these elements, Lord, we do pray that they would strengthen our bodies. And you said if we eat this body and drink this blood, we'd have life. And we know that means eternal life. But we also know that you'll give us life here. And we trust you for it. Bless every person here this morning, Lord. Don't let any of us go away hungry for you or for a closer walk with you. But help us right now to begin to draw closer to you, to be more like you and to serve you to the fullest. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. We bid them farewell on live stream.